But I take this opportunity of welcoming each and every one along to our special gospel service tonight. And it's encouraging to see so many gathered into the church this evening. This our first Sunday night back after this latest lockdown. You're very, very welcome indeed. And for those joining with us through social media, you're very welcome as well, listening in to our service tonight. And we pray that the Lord will come and meet with us tonight around his precious, precious word. And let's all bow in prayer and let us seek the Lord's face once again today as we come into the presence of the Lord. Father in heaven, we thank thee and we praise thee that we can truly say that Jesus saves, Jesus saves. We thank the Lord for many here tonight who can testify to this wonderful truth that the Lord Jesus has saved them, redeemed them not with corruptible things, just as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. And, O oh God, we do pray for our service tonight. We pray, Lord, for a real sense of thy presence. We pray, Lord, that you'll bless the one that will sing. We pray that you'll bless our brother's testimony. O oh God, we just ask of thee, that everything that's said and done tonight and sung tonight would uplift and glorify the person and the work of our blessed Savior. We thank thee, Lord, for every head bowed in your presence. And, O oh God, as we come before thee again this evening, we would remember especially those who are bereaved. We do pray, Lord, for the Gateway family again. We think of Audrey and her family. We pray, Lord, that they might know that underneath and round about are the everlasting arms. Comfort them, Lord. We pray, Lord, for the Hearn family. We think of Raymond and his family. Oh God, we pray for Raymond and Mabel and all their family circle, that again they would know the very presence of the Lord. And oh God, we would not forget again this evening our royal family. We pray for the Queen. We ask the Lord that you would comfort her heart and the hearts of all the royal family in the passing of Prince Philip. We pray, Lord, that in these days they would know the very nearness and the presence of the Lord with them. O oh God, it reminds us again that in the midst of life we're in death. But we thank Thee for the one who died and the one who rose again and the one who ever lives to make intercession for His people. And we praise Thee, Lord, that our Savior said that He was the resurrection. O oh God, we thank Thee that You're the resurrection and the life and all who believe in You shall never die. We praise Thee that there is eternal life found alone in Jesus Christ. We pray this evening, Lord, as we conduct this service, that you would come, Lord, and bless every heart. And, Lord, for those who are still unsaved, we pray that you'll bring them lovingly and eternally to the foot of the cross. Bless us now, therefore. In Jesus' precious, precious name, we ask it. Amen. At this part of our service, just like to make a few announcements very, very quickly, and they're very brief. Again, let me take the opportunity of welcoming each and every one along to the service tonight. This, of course, is our first Sunday night back, as we have said, after the lockdown. It's encouraging to see so many in this evening. And if you're visiting, we give you a very warm welcome. And we pray that the Lord will bless you as you listen to uh, the testimony this evening. We are delighted to have our brother Victor Maxwell with us tonight. We welcome him. Um, we pray as he shares his testimony with us that the Lord will encourage him, encourage us through him as he relates to us how he was saved. Just a few announcements. Do remember on Tuesday night, 8 o'clock, the prayer meeting here in the main building. And I'll be here, God willing, on Tuesday night to take the prayer meeting. Uh, the, the Youth Fellowship on Friday night, young people via Zoom to the end of this month. So do please remember your meeting on Friday evening. And then the service is next Lord's Day, 11.30 in the morning and 6.30 at night. And God willing, I'll be here to preach next Sunday morning. Next Sunday night, we're having another special testimony. Our brother Philip Harton will be coming along to give his testimony. And he'll be giving a youth challenge as well. So young people do remember that special meeting next Sunday evening. Uh, David Warwick will be here to next Sunday night to sing. And our sister Mary Baxter will be singing next Sunday uh, morning. Again, let me just uh, remind the congregation of what is opening up this month in the will of the Lord after the lockdown. The Sunday school will be, will be recommencing on Sunday the 25th of April. So parents do remember that for a few weeks just before they break off again for the summer. Then on Tuesday the 27th of April, we're going to have 
a special communion service here. We normally have it after the service on the Sunday morning or Sunday evening, but because of these current sit- the current situation, we're going to have it on the Tuesday night. We'll say more about that but in a few weeks' time, but just keep that date in mind, Tuesday the 27th of April. And then from next month, uh, the, the Vision magazine will be free. And again, I draw your attention to that. And as I said this morning, if you have paid for your magazine this year, then you can get a refund if you see, you see Billy. From the last Sunday of June, God willing, the 27th, we're going to have some drive-in services on a Sunday night over the summertime. Now, these drive-in services certainly were a blessing last year. So we're going to have some more of them this year. Uh, we're going to have them alternative Sunday nights, but do please pray for those special opener services that the Lord will bless as His Word goes forth. Now, I think this is all the announcements. We are delighted to have our brother Victor Maxwell with us. Victor, you're very, very welcome. So you are. And he's come tonight to share his testimony with us. And we're looking forward to that. I'm going to ask him to come now and give his testimony. God bless you, brother. God bless. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, joy to be with you here this evening in Tandrigee. And I thank the Reverend Gray for the opportunity of returning to this church this evening. And I think I can recognize some people behind their masks. It's a, it's a bit difficult. Of course, we can't shake hands. Well, we can't shake hands. We just shake hands up here and say good evening to everyone. Uh, A joy to always come and give a word of testimony. But before we do that, I'd like to read the Scriptures from 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we're reading at verse 12. The Apostle Paul, throughout his letters, he constantly referred to, to how God saved him, constantly gave testimony. It is said of Gypsy Smith that after 60 years of conversion, he never got over the wonder of what God had done in his life. And and that was the Apostle Paul. He never got over the wonder of God's amazing grace. And so we pick up the reading in verse 12 when Paul wrote these words, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. How be it for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth uh, all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now, unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And amen. God always blesses to us the public reading of his sacred word. Now, looking back to give a word of testimony, uh, we're going back a lot of years, and it reminds me of the story of a, of a couple. The, the lady was ill, and their husband wanting to do something to help her. He decided that while she was in bed, he would break a loaf of her favorite bread. And so it was. He went down to the shop, and he bought the ingredients, and uh, he brought in the flour and the margarine, and... Uh, and when it came to kneading it all, he knew he needed to put in the yeast, but he didn't know how much to put in. So he put it all in. And uh, he got the dough and got it into a tin and put it into the oven. And then he went up to sit at the side of Maggie's bed. And, and as he talked to her very soon, the smell of the bread was wafting through the house. And she looked at him and she said, Johnny, you, you haven't been baking bread for me. He says, I have, but he said, I had a bit of a problem. I didn't know how much yeast to put in, so I put it all in. Oh, she said, that's a... And just as she spoke that, there was an almighty bang downstairs. So he ran away downstairs, and when he was there, she shouted down, Johnny, can you not keep it in the oven? He says, Maggie, I can't keep it in the kitchen. Well, that's how it is when it comes to the word of testimony, how to fit it all in. 
Let me go back to the beginning. I was born on the Donegal Road in Belfast, not into a Christian home, but into a good home. Uh, my father was a football referee and did international matches in uh, England and Scotland, England and Scotland. And, and so my life was very much taken up with football, my brother and myself, uh, football. But besides that, also the street we lived in on the Donegal Road, the church hall was at the corner. It was of Richview Presbyterian Church. So my life was football and church. The church hall was only 50 yards from our home. And so every Sunday morning, my father took us, my brother and me, to uh, Richview Presbyterian Church. And during the week, why, church was my life. I was in the Sunday school, I was in the Life Boys, and I was in the BB. And then even the nights of the GB, we would still go to the, the church hall, but that was for other reasons. And, uh, but, but I was taken up with, with Sunday school. Uh, Sunday school, we had a very good... Uh, Sunday school teacher, his name was Billy Hamilton. Billy could not have stood in a pulpit like this, but Billy had five boys in his class, and out of the five boys in his class, he not only saw all five of them converted, but four of them, two of them went to Brazil, one went as a brethren missionary to Africa, and the other became a pastor, a, a preacher. And so if you're a Sunday school teacher, be encouraged. You don't know what the harvest will bring in. And so Billy Hamilton, week by week, taught us the Scriptures. I remember as a boy when I attended school, there were two lads in our class, one called Bobby McIntyre. Bobby didn't come to school one day, and then he was missing for a week and two weeks, and very soon we got word that Bobby was very seriously ill. And then the word came after three weeks that Bobby had died. But, they said, Bobby had got saved. He'd become a Christian, and Bobby had gone to heaven. There was another lad in our class, and, and he was playing. It was Students' Day, Rag Day, as it was in Belfast, and he hopped on the back of a truck and fell off the truck, was run over by a bus, and he died. There was no such word that had gone to heaven. And the death of these two friends in school when I was about 13 years of age, why it troubled my heart. And even as a young lad, I would wonder, where would I have been if I had gone into eternity? without the assurance of knowing Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Now, back in those days, you left school at 14. As a matter of fact, something else happened. We always wore short trousers until we turned 14, and then we got, we got long trousers. You used to talk about sliding down the banister, and we felt we'd become adults. I'd gone out to work. I got a job as a telegram boy in Belfast. That involved, when I was 16 years of age, driving a a BSA Bantam motorbike delivering tele telegrams all over uh, Belfast. However, there was one telegram boy, and he said to me, w would you come with me next Sunday night? Instead of going to Richview Church, I'd like you to go to Ravenhill Free Presbyterian Church. My granny lived just a stone's throw from Dr. Paisley's church. She never did throw stones at the church. She attended the meetings there. And when he invited me to go, I said, of course, my granny lives there. And so it was, that was... Way back 1956, I went that Sunday evening. I didn't fall asleep. Dr. Paisley, on the wide platform that he had, he preached. He used all of the platform, walking up and down the platform, thumping the desk, and preached with passion, sometimes out of the pulpit, down the aisles, pleading with people to come to Christ. And I sat up in the gallery. Everything that Billy Hamilton had taught me in Sunday school came flooding back to my mind. That sense that I was a sinner, the nearness of eternity, the uncertainty of where I would be, and it, it touched my heart. And when Dr. Paisley made the appeal, I so wanted to put my hand up and say, Christ for me. But the Bible says, the fear of man brings a snare, and that was the snare that grabbed me. I was afraid of two things. I was afraid, first of all, if I take this step to become a Christian, I'll never be able to keep it. I was 16 years of age, but the other thing that gripped me, that as a telegram boy, there were 70 telegram boys, all between the age of 16 and 18. And if I go in tomorrow morning and tell them I've become a Christian, well, they'll, they'll laugh at me, they'll make fun of me. And so it was, when the appeal was made, I, I so wanted to become a Christian, but fear paralyzed my heart, and I left the service. I went back the next Sunday night, and the following Sunday night. And I went for five Sunday nights and listened to Dr. Paisley preach, I still remember the last Sunday night, the 28th of October, 
1956, coming down, the, the stairs were out in the church, coming down the stairs from the gallery, and I, I spied someone that I hadn't seen for two years, a girl that I'd been to school with. Uh, she had had tuberculosis and was in what we called in those days the sanatorium, Foster Greens. She was as white as a sheet, and I looked at her and I said, Lily, what are you doing here? And she said, what are you doing here? Are you a Christian? When she asked me that question and my heart troubled, uh, I looked quite embarrassed. And I said, no, I'm not a Christian. And then she said, would you not like to become a Christian? And I thank God that from somewhere within me that night, I said, yes, I'd love to become a Christian. Within a few minutes, I was in the inquiry room with Dr. Paisley, and he led me to personal faith in Jesus Christ, into my heart, come into my heart, Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. That day changed my life. I look back and I say in the words of the hymn, O happy day that fixed my choice. On thee, my Savior and my God, well may this glowing heart rejoice to tell its raptures all abroad. I didn't know that telling the raptures of the gospel would occupy just about the rest of my life, but I had to tell the fellows who worked. I had to go home and tell my parents. My mum used to say to me, your head's full of notions, son. It'll soon pass. Thank God it never passed. The, the next thing was to go into work and 60 telegram boys. And when I got into work at 7 o'clock the next morning, I found I didn't have to tell 70 telegram boys. I only told two or three, but within half an hour, all of them knew about it. D did they make fun? Of course they made fun. They laughed and they ridiculed and uh, but I'll tell you this young people that always pays to take your stand for Jesus Christ and so testifying to the gospel amongst those young people we had the joy of seeing some of them trust Christ the Savior some of those who trusted the Lord became missionaries and became pastors preachers of the Word of God and I say again always confess the Lord Jesus before others it really pays after I became a Christian, back in those days, we went to Dunmurray Free Presbyterian Church, and we joined a band of people who were in open airs and active for the Lord. I remember one day delivering posts in O'Meath Street on the Woodstock Road. And in those days, as you went up the streets, why, there were net curtains in the window, and most houses had a brass pot with a plant in it sitting at the window. But when I came to this house halfway up the street, it didn't have any curtains or any pots with plants in them. They only had gospel texts in, in the window. And then big quotations from uh, Charles Finney and from D.L. Moody and, and gospel writers. And when I knocked the door, the man who opened the door had the broadest smile I've ever seen in my life. His name was Ernie Allen, founder of Every Home Crusade and the Revival Movement. And when I was introduced to Ernie, why, he recruited me. Very soon we were out not only taking part in gospel meetings with Ernie, but also he recruited me to deliver gospel leaflets. He was churning them out in his, in his room. These, you see every home crusade today, beautiful literature. Well, Ernie was churning them out on a little printing machine in his room. And I had to visit every home in Dunmurray with the gospel of Christ. And so it was this fire of enthusiasm, Saturday nights down in the middle of Belfast, and I see Trevor and Mary here this evening, they will remember those eight days back at the Ravenhill Free Presbyterian Church, and the young people, and the zeal, and the fire. However, something happened in my life that touched me. It was in 1958, a lot of young people, 18 years of age, a lot of our young people, we went up the Antrim coast for a, a day, a Saturday up over Tor Head, there were about nine or ten young people in, in two cars. And, and when we got to Portrush, we went for a swim in the Blue Pool. I think they call it the Blue Pool because that's the color you turn when you get into the water up there. And into that North Atlantic water while we were swimming and diving. And, and uh, amongst the group, there were a number of nurses. And one of them was a Jamaican girl by the name of Dorothy. She couldn't swim, and when she got into the water, she didn't turn blue. She, she went gray. And uh, nothing to do with your name, incidentally, but uh, she, she went gray. And, uh, and then one of the, the, the friends, the girl who had spoken to me the night I got saved, she said, Victor, would you not take Dorothy across the pool? Well, I can swim for myself, but I'd never taken anyone else. But uh, 
I still have the problem of, of saying no. And so I, I said I would take Dorothy. I got Dorothy by the back of her arms and began on her back to, to swim across or float across the, the blue pool when Dorothy panicked and swung round and grabbed me by the neck. And the next thing, both of us were under the water. When we came back up out of the water, there were yells and shouts and people jumping into the pool, and they grabbed Dorothy, and then I went down for the second time. And when I came up again, I, they were trying to get me out of the water, but I went down the third time. Eighteen years of age, I felt my life was over. From somewhere, someone came from beneath me and pushed me up out of the water, onto the rocks, away from the shore. And I, I lay there. They threw out a life belt, and by this time, a crowd had gathered, and when they brought me ashore in the life belt, there was a doctor there, Dr. Love from the Victoria Hall, a brethren uh, preacher he was. He gave me artificial respiration. I think I still remember the spouts of water. There must have been half the Atlantic in my lungs that day. But very soon the blue bell came with the ambulance, and I was rushed off to Colerain Hospital. I was in Colerain Hospital for four days, recovering but on that hospital bed, God spoke to me. You're a Christian, but your life was almost over. What are you going to do with your life? And in that hospital and in that room, I surrendered all of my life to Jesus Christ, whatever and wherever it might be. At that time, I was attending missionary prayer meetings, writing to missionaries and reading missionary stories. And this challenge was in my heart. And I had this conviction that God wanted me to be a a missionary, and I remember one Sunday night at the Murray Free Presbyterian Church waiting behind to speak to Mr. Leatham, the minister at that time. And when I explained to him, he said, Victor, go home, and you tell the Lord exactly what you feel in your heart. And if it's God, ask Him to speak to you from His Word. Don't open your Bible at random, but take your Bible reading, and you will find that God will answer you. If it's of God, He will speak to you. I remember that Sunday night when I got home, there was no one there, and I got down at the side of the bed with an open Bible, reading as it was for my reading that day, John chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000. And then Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. You know the story. The storm came, and Jesus came walking to them on the water. The disciples were afraid. And out of the page, remembering I'm asking, Lord, of this, is this of you? Out of the page came these words, It is I, be not afraid. It is I, be not afraid. My friend, can I say that promise that I received that night? That's coming on 60 years ago, and I still need that promise today. Just the assurance to know it is the Lord. I read in their prayer room, uh, someone has a text up. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. And so God gave me the, the confirmation that night that God was calling me. Uh, at that time, I met Audrey, Audrey Smith, as she was. I, I should say, well, I can't say that she ran after me. She's not here, so I could say anything about her. But uh, Audrey and I got together, and uh, I went off to the Bible College in, in Glasgow, the Missionary Training College in Glasgow. Audrey, thereafter, she went off to the Bible College of Wales, and we went together for five years, but for five years we didn't see each other. I used to kiss the stamps and the envelopes and send them to Audrey. I don't know what she did in sending them back to me, but that's, that's how it was for five years. I was two years in training in Glasgow, and then to the Missionary School of Medicine in London. During the time I was at Bible College, I was, I was greatly challenged. Here I was in Glasgow training to go to a foreign field to be a missionary, and yet back home my mom and dad weren't, weren't saved. And so I'd been praying for them, but it was a challenge to see them come to Christ before I would leave our shores. In our second year of Bible college, I got an invitation to lead a, a team of students to conduct a gospel mission at, at Newton Bray, the Baptist Church. And uh, I remember that mission, why it was 1963, April 1963, what is that, 58 years ago, uh, this very month, conducting that mission. And many people were saved, young people were challenged. Some of those young people went to the mission field. The mission was so blessed that the pastor of the church wrote to the college and asked, could we go on for another week? And so we went on for another week. And I still remember the last night of the mission preaching on Jeremiah 8.20, 
The harvest is past, the summer has ended, and you are not saved. Thank God one man got saved that night. It was my father. My father trusted Christ as Savior. Within a few months, my mother trusted the Lord. Thank God today they're in heaven. That day made a difference on the day that they went to be with Christ. Uh, after I saw my mom and dad saved and my brother come to the Lord, why Audrey and I were now apply, we had applied to Acre Gospel Mission in 1964, and we got married on the 30th of January 1965 with a view of traveling to Brazil with Acre Gospel Mission in February, that is just a few weeks after we would be married. However, the boat was delayed and uh, we didn't leave till the 5th of April. Back in those days, to get to Brazil and God calling us and now confirming and opening up the way for us, the 5th of April, it took us six weeks to get to Brazil. I still remember we traveled to Portugal and to Trinidad and Barbados and then to the Amazon and taking our time going up the Amazon a thousand miles to the city of Manaus. It's not uncommon nowadays, but back in those days, we'd go to the barbers every two weeks. But after being at sea for six weeks, the my hair was over my ears, and so the day after I got to Brazil, I thought I'd better get a haircut. I couldn't speak Portuguese, but I saw a, a barber salon, and I went in. The barber showed me the chair, and he began to cut and cut and cut. And when I thought he's getting too much off, I, I didn't know what to say to him. I remember seeing the traffic light red. It said, Pari, P-A-R-E, Pari. And so I, I said to the barber, Pari, Pari. He looked at me, and it's then he really began to cut. I mean, sparks were coming out of the scissors over the top of my head, and he left me with a little tuft of hair in the front, giving me a military haircut with the rest of my head shaved. I didn't know that the word I'd said to him appears uh, another word. When you want the barber to take a little more off, you say, a pari. And that's what he thought I was saying, a pari. And so he aparou and took the, my hair. It realized I needed to learn Portuguese if I'm going to live in this this land. And so it was with Fred Orr. We studied Portuguese in the town of Labria, the town where Fred had buried his wife. We'd often go to Ina's grave and stand there and, and look at what it cost to open the gospel into that town. What a challenge it was. But it was there that we cut our teeth in, in learning the language and beginning to preach. And in December that year, we joined Dr. Bill Woods in the in the city of Kanatama. When it comes to learning languages, everybody makes mistakes, and you've got to learn to laugh at your mistakes. When Bill Woods was learning Portuguese, he wanted to buy batteries for his radio, and, and so he asked Molly Harvey, how do I ask for batteries? And Molly wrote it out, O senhor tem pilha. The word for battery is pilha. The only thing is that when Bill got to the shop, the P for pilha looked like an F. And instead of asking for batteries, he, he, he said, Could you, do you have any filias? Pilia is battery, filia is a daughter. When he got to the shop and said to the man, do you have any daughters? And the man said, yes, I do. Bill said, I'd like to buy four of them, please. And so learning a language can be an embarrassing situation, and, and very soon we learned Portuguese. And, and in Kanatama, from that December 1950s, at 1965 onwards, why God was blessing in a great way. In that town, it was dominated by a Roman Catholic priest, a Spanish priest by the name of Fray Dorio. He so dominated the town that when people got converted, if you got converted, then your children couldn't go to school. He had the only school in town. And the people who were converted, why the children were not allowed to go back to school. I remember we had a little wooden church, maybe about a third of the size of this church. We had a little wooden church, no windows. There are windows on it, but there's no glass in the windows. And the priest coming to stand outside the door to try to stop the people coming in. There was a lot of opposition, but you cannot stop the blessing of God. And God blessed in that town. And so many children were barred from going to school that Bill Woods and I, we built the school. Now, Bill worked in an office, and I worked in the post office. We had never built anything in our lives before. And so we built a, a, a classroom onto the back of the church. It's what you call a lean-to. It needed to lean on something or when we built it, but it was a lean-to school with two classrooms. And we had 90 boys and girls in that school. That was the measure of blessing that there had been in the town. Why, people were coming to Christ, and, and, and blessing was flowing in the town of Kanatama. 
Murderers were coming to Christ. Religionists were coming to Christ. Uh, they were coming on Sunday and Monday, and, and God was blessing in a great way. However, there was a lot of opposition. At, at that particular time, there was, there was no doctors or nurses. I was doing a little bit uh, of dental extractions and treating the sick. The nearest doctor to where we live was 10 days by boat or 3 hours by aeroplane, if you, if you think of seeing a doctor and you have to fly to Frankfurt, that's the sort of distances that we could seek medical help. We had a disease that we called the black fever, and it touched mostly young people. And young people, why they would become ill and with just lethargic, and within two days, a low-grade fever, and the third, fourth day, they'd go unconscious. And then by the fifth day, they would vomit this black stuff that, that, that uh, and that's why they called it the black fever and so many of those children I carried in my arms and sadly had to bury so many of them we know of one family with seven children and they lost six of them to black fever it was a desperate situation at that particular time but you know uh, one night I tell you that because one night Audrey and Hazel Miskimmon our co-worker were down in the city of Manas, and I was in Kanotam on my own, and uh, just about to go to the prayer meeting Wednesday night. Our prayer meeting started at half past seven and finished at half past eight because we had electric light, one generator in the town, but it went on at six o'clock at night and went off at nine o'clock every night. And so we finished our meeting by 8.30. But just going into the prayer meeting, this man came to me and he said, my daughter's very ill upriver. It's an hour's journey upriver. Can you come and help us? He was crying. And I said, let's finish the prayer meeting and then we'll go. And so we had our prayer meeting that night. And uh, after the prayer meeting, I got a young fellow out of the church to come with me. We got into our mission boat and we traveled upriver for an hour. While we were gone, we'd left at nine o'clock. While we were gone, there was a fight in the town. Now the lights were out and it was dark. And the local tax collector who had left his wife and family in the city of Manaus, uh, 10 days away by boat, three hours by aeroplane. He was in the town on his own, and he was doing what he shouldn't have done. He had gone out with his guitar and sat under the, a window in typical Latin style, serenading a girl who wasn't his wife. And an Indian in the town, seeing what was happening, he knew it was wrong. So he went with his flashlight and shot it into the tax collector's eyes and said, what you're doing is wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. And the tax collector lost the head and took his guitar and smashed it over the head of the Indian. The Indian was upset, and he ran home to get his gun. And he came hunting for the tax collector. Now, the tax collector was, he looked a bit like me, a little smaller than me, but at midnight, in the dark, you wouldn't much, know much difference. Uh, Juan Bautista, the boy who was with me, the two of us got back to town after treating that little girl and praying with the family. We got back to town at midnight. And I saw Jean Baptiste back to his house. And there was only one street in the town, a little interior jungle town of Kanatama. And I didn't know that while I was walking up the street, the Indian was coming down the street with his shotgun in hand, looking for a man who looked like me. In the providence of God, I got to our house first, and I just turned in, not aware of anything. Uh, of course, we had no locks on our doors. We had just a wooden thing to put on the back of the door. And next thing, I grabbed the kettle to make a cup of tea. And suddenly, the gunfire started. Bong, bong, and I fell to my knees. I, I was sure they were shooting at us. I crept into our room to see they were shooting at our bed. Remember, there are windows, but there's no glass in them. There's what we call tallow. There's netting to keep mosquitoes out. And then I crept to Hazel Miss Skimmon's room to see if they were shooting there. And just as I got back on my feet, knocking at the door, come quickly, Pastor Victor, come quickly, come quickly. Senior John's been shot in the head. When I turned into the house, the Indian, I just met him, and uh, the, from our house to the side of the river, it's only 50 yards, he'd got to the side of the river, he saw two men, he went for them. One of them jumped into the river, and the other got the gun and wrestled with him to outside our house when the gunfire started. When that happened, the... the the Indian, he had only one shot left, and, and when it didn't hit the fellow, then he took his knife, what we call a peshera, a knife about that length, and he took it and just ripped it up from the bottom of the neck up into the temple of the head, and Sr. Zhuang was, was in a bad state. 
I grabbed my first aid bag and I made my way down to the, the boat. The Saint Juan was uh, lying on the deck of the boat, uh, unconscious, his wife in hysterics. To try and stop the flow of blood, she had emptied a, a kilo bag, two pound bag of coffee powder into the wound, but the blood was throbbing through the wound. The artery was severed. And here we were. Well, I remember spending time getting the coffee out of the wound and then suturing and stopping the blood supply and then suturing it up to about half past four in the morning. But I'll tell you, with that opposition in the town, my friend, God continued to bless. And even through that incident, why it opened doors for the gospel. And today we have many young people from Kanatama in Christian work, all because of taking a stand in that town. I don't have time to tell you about all the other things. When we opened the door into the town of Tarawaka, again, a town that was dominated by two German priests, uh, Padre Umberto and, uh, oh, I forget the name of the other one just at the moment. But these two German priests dominated the town. When Tom Geddes and I arrived in the town, they announced over the loudspeaker, warning people, these are two, two uh, they didn't call us missionaries, two people who have fled from their country and are in our town. Beware of them. However, at that time, Audrey and myself went with Tom and Ethel, and we went down to the side of the river, and we started meetings for boys and girls. Uh, we had flannel graph, and we'll teach them to sing in Portuguese. And uh, the next day, there were about 100 people there, adults. And so right through that week, the first gospel meetings in Tarawaka, how much God blessed. As a matter of fact, some of you may know Lucy Marr. She was only a nine-year-old girl at that time, and she trusted Christ during that week of meetings. I had to leave for three months and go to another town, and Audrey stayed on with Tom and Ethel uh, to, to help do studies. Uh, Audrey conducted studies on the Virgin Mary to try and get the, the ladies to come in. Tom bought an old house that was up in stilts, and uh, when I went back after three months, why, we had a week of gospel meetings. Uh, we didn't, the old house was, was just an old house, like I say. There were no benches. I had to spend a week making benches. And then when the people started to come in, I nearly needed a week of prayer that the benches wouldn't collapse onto them. But I still remember that week of meetings. Why, God bless in an amazing way. Sixteen people trusted Christ as Savior. Some nights I was preaching with my back to the wall, every seat taken and holding, people sitting on the floor, down the aisles, children round your feet. It was a great opportunity, and, and God blessed in an amazing way. In the course of time, we had to pull that old house down. We extended it five times, pulled it down, built a new church. God was blessing. There were neighbors who wouldn't come into our meetings, but because there was windows and no glass, then they could sit on their veranda and listen to the meetings. Donna Edna got saved. Next door, Edgy Mayer got saved. Next door, Senior Zhuang, an alcoholic, he got saved. Next door, Senior Milton. Next door, Marie Espanol, across the road, Donna Elena. Next door, Hebrew Mar. All of the neighbors trusted Christ as Savior. Every Sunday night in Tarawaka, during those years of 70, 71 through 74, why 15 to 20 people were trusting Christ as Savior. It was a wave of blessing. I don't have time to tell you about the river journeys, but let me just single one particular incident out. When Audrey and I were in that situation, again, it's far from any medical help. Our colleague, Dr. Tom Geddes, had gone home. Him and his wife were at home, and Audrey and I, as I've said, in the midst of this blessing, there was opposition not only from uh, Catholicism, but also Spiritism. I remember coming outside our house one door one morning, and here at the front door of our house was this, uh, like a chicken, and it was covered with, uh, as, as if a dog had been sick. And when I was going to clean it up, someone said, don't touch it, it's the curse of Makumba, voodoo in the town, had put a curse. And some people in the town warned us, they've put a curse on your family, Pastor Victor, be careful. I remember at that time, a door was opening in a neighboring town called Fejo, and I'd gone there to do meetings and tried to get a work started, and Audrey stayed with the two girls in Tarawaka. The Air Force, Brazilian Air Force, had a plane that came on the Thursday, and it was going from town to town, and I took the opportunity of going up in the morning on the plane and then coming back in the afternoon in the Air Force plane. But when I got there, our Heather, she was less than two years old, and she was burning with a fever of 103 and 104, and Audrey was quite distracted. 
Uh, we, I needed to go back to Fejon. I'd left our stuff there. And so I said, I'll take our oldest girl, I'll take Sharon with me. Uh, I didn't like to tell Audrey that where I was staying, I was staying in a, in a grubby place with rats. I remember every night the rats running around the rafters of the house. You could see their white bellies as I tried to sh shine the light and sleeping on the floor on a, an old mattress. I didn't like to tell Audrey I was taking Sharon to that, but I Audrey spent that night while I was away in Fejaw. She spent the night holding Heather in the, the sink full of water and pouring water over her to try and keep the temperature down. The whole night, no, no doctor, three hours away to get a doctor on an aeroplane. And so it was the next morning at seven o'clock, she sent word to one of the deacons to come because it was Friday morning, a plane would be coming. It came once a week. Uh, it would be coming on Friday morning and she needed to get Heather to the doctor in Rio Branco. And so it was, they carried Heather for about a mile to the airfield. It's not an airport, it's only a, a field. And when she got there, there were soldiers and nuns, and they were all waiting for the plane. While Audrey was paying for her ticket, uh, one, the deacon was holding Heather, and just with that, she took this convulsive state and began to throw herself around, and then she went absolutely limp. And soldiers and nuns were shouting, she's dead, she's dead, the child's dead, and Audrey, quite frantically, was trying to give her mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Over there in Fejou, in that terrible circumstance, now we couldn't see the rats, but you could hear them gnawing. I couldn't see them because the flashlight had gone down. The mattress was, was damp because, I don't want to say too much in the meeting, but the cats had been on the mattress during the day and left it wet during the day. And, and here I was with our other daughter. Next morning, when, that, when the plane landed and the pilot saw Audrey State and all the crowd, he put Audrey on board and took off and said he would send a radio message to me. I got a message to be in the airport in 10 minutes. The plane was landing with Heather seriously ill. And so I took Heather and the belongings, Sharon rather, and the belongings we had around the little airfield and the old DC-3 plane landed, just opened the side door and the hauled the two of us up into the, 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 the plane and it took off again for two hours to Rio Branco. When we got there, ambulances there and they were all there to, to meet us and thank God our Heather got better. Today she is a fine lady living in the United States of America. But I ended up in hospital. I got a uh, an allergy to catch urine that had been on the mattress that night and and these lumps all over my body and so I was taken into hospital. I still still remember them letting me out because I, I wanted to get to Manaus the next morning on a flight and they were letting me out of hospital at five o'clock in the morning and they got me into an ambulance with a lady and a little baby and I said to her, is the baby ill? She said, no, but the rats came down in the middle of the night and were chewing at the the baby's toes, and that's why they're in hospital. These were the, the terrible conditions. But I want to finish this story up with, with telling you what was happening. For all of that opposition and all of that pressure, how God was blessing. During that week of meetings that we had in Tarawaka at the beginning of that, week, that work, there was a 16-year-old girl who trusted Christ as Savior. Her name was Iolanda. Iolanda received Christ and her life was changed, but it was difficult for her to go home. You see, her mother was a prostitute. She lived in a, in a disheveled house covered with palm leaves and some of the, the planks along the wall they were missing and it was over a swamp. They lived in abject poverty. It was terrible. And when she told her mother that she'd become a Christian, you can imagine how the mother, a prostitute, was embarrassed. Maria Espanol was her name. However, Yolanda began to witness to her about the, and invite her to the meetings. And after that week of meetings, six weeks afterwards, Maria Espanol came to the meetings and she trusted Jesus Christ as personal Savior. When she got saved, Ethel Geddes said to Tom, Tom, she's got saved. She, she can't go back to be a prostitute. She has three children. How she go? That's why she was a prostitute. She, she was selling her body to... To, to earn money to feed her children. You can't let her go back to that. Get her a job in the hospital. We had a 13-bed hospital. Tom was the doctor and surgeon. He had taught me how to do the anesthetic, so I was the anesthetist at the hospital. And, uh, 
And so it was, we recruited Mary to be the, the, the laundrette at the hospital. That was putting all the whites of the hospital in the massive pots and boiling oil in the hot sun over an open fire. It was hard work, but it was a change. And there was Mary, every meeting with her Bible. She couldn't read very well, but she carried her Bible to church, and her life was changed. Mary was a, a washerwoman for two, two years, but it was hard work. And one day an opening came in the kitchen. Now, it's not any sort of hospital like Craig Oven. This is an old wooden hospital built up in stilts, holes on the floors, the wooden floors, and holes in the wooden walls, uh, marked with water and rain, and, and just a, a, an old building, but 13 beds, and Tom Geddes did a fantastic work. Mary and I became a, a cook, and that was fantastic. Tom Geddes and I used to go down every night at 9 o'clock to do the ward rounds, but we'd take revolvers with us because when we opened the, the store, there were rats everywhere, and we'd be shooting with our pistols, trying to shoot she rot, rats uh, 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 in the hospital. Can you imagine that? Well, after two years of being a cook, one day Tom came home and said, we, we need a nurse. Now, we didn't have any nurses trained in, in the hospitals here. You had to train the nurses yourself, teach them how to take pulse, how to take temperature, how to take blood pressure, and you taught them these, these basic things. When Tom came home and said, we, we need a nurse, Ethel said, why do we get Maria Espanol? Maria, Tom said, Maria, my, Maria can't even count. How are you going? Ethel said, I'll teach her to count. And so it was every night. Ethel taught her to count. One, two, three. And Mary used to do one, two, three. What comes after three? What comes after three? Can you imagine taking the pulse like that? And Ethel would smack her, her wrist and say, four. And so within a month, she learned to count. And Maria became a nurse. Now, you wouldn't have wanted Maria as your nurse. I remember one day a man had had a snake bite and they brought him into the hospital and he'd got better and Tom was doing a skin graft and, and I was in as Tom took the skin and put it on the, I'd given the anesthetic and, and uh, they'd put the skin graft and then before we'd do the next operation Tom said keep an eye on him that when he comes out of his anesthetic he doesn't grab down for the leg and disturb the skin graft and so for 20 minutes I, I looked at the fellow. Tom said, come on, it's time for the next operation. I said, what about the man? Get Maria to look after him. So I got Maria, told her, don't let him come round, don't let him touch the leg. Tom delayed another while, and Tom said, let's go. I said, Tom, where do you see? Maria, who stood, uh, taller than me was Maria, stood with her arms folded, looking down at the patient. And every time the man stirred and lifted his head, Maria just clouded him. <laughs> And put the man back out again. So I don't think you would want a nurse like that. Another day a man came who had been shot in the leg and they'd hid him in the forest for six months. The superstition is that if you're injured in any sort of knife or shot, you don't let anybody see you because of the fear of the evil eye. Superstition. And during that time that you're ill, they don't wash you. So can you imagine living in the forest for six months and water hasn't touched your body? The man was getting worse, and a web had formed between the ball of his leg and his thigh, and the leg had been bent up for all those six months. They brought him to the hospital, and the first law of the hospital is that you've got to give him a, a wash. I remember being in the hospital the day they brought the man in, and Mary was assigned to, to give the man a bath. It was a, a room, a ward, but it was, as I said, it's an old hospital, a wooden floor with plenty of holes in it. And when I looked in, the man was sitting on a stool in his birthday suit, and Mary was taking these five-gallon tins of water and just sh 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 oh, emptying them over, and then another one, sh emptying them over, and the poor man was nearly drowned. I don't know if she was trying to make him a Baptist or whatever it was, but she nearly drowned him. Later that night, as I say, we'd go down every night to the, the hospital for the ward rounds at 9 o'clock, and when we got there at 9 o'clock that night, the poor man was sitting on his bed, shivering, and as pink as could be. And Tom said, what happened to you? Oh, she said, that nurse, Maria Espanol, that nurse couldn't get the dirt off me, so she took Brillo pads, and she has Brillo pad me from head to toe. Can you, you wouldn't want her as your nurse. Tom came home one day and said, Ethel, we need a midwife. <laughs> I said, get Maria Espanol. Maria Espanol. Ethel had powers of persuasion, and Maria Espanol became a midwife. 
As a matter of fact, when all of us left Tarawakan in 1985, and Tom and Ethel were coming home, Maria was the best midwife in town. After we left, she put in, now she had built a little house for herself, and she put an extension to the house, the antenatal clinic it was, and the rich people of the town would send their wives and their daughters to the antenatal clinic at Maria Espanol, and there she would deliver many babies in that little antenatal clinic. When she retired at 65 years of age, she turned that antenatal clinic into a prayer room, and where babies had been born, now, thank God, ladies were born again as she taught the Scriptures. Maria Espanol went to be with the Lord about eight years ago. Four years ago, I was in Tarawaka, back there for anniversary meetings because God had blessed that work and still is blessing that work. It's an amazing what the Lord has done. But being back in the town, and because our girls were reared in the town, one of their daughters born in the town, why, why, it was all familiar to us. And I walked around the town, and I was struck with a brand new building. It was the family clinic. And above the family clinic were written these words, Family Clinic, dedicated to the memory of Maria Espanol. Think, my friend, she'd been a prostitute on the streets of the town. And by the grace of God, God reached her and changed her and made her a citizen, a blessing to that town, and better still. Maria Spaniel is with the Lord, but her grandson, Fagner, is the pastor of the church in Tarawaka. Oh, it's hard to keep it in the kitchen. My time is far gone, and you excuse me, but let me finish by saying this. The Apostle Paul, recalling the days of his ministry, he thanked God for the ministry that God had given to him. Did he not say that word, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And what a ministry he had, opening towns for the gospel of Christ, being in prison and preaching the gospel, singing the truth of the gospel. He thanked God for the ministry of the gospel. And I'm looking back. And 60 years of Christian work, and we thank God for the ministry of the gospel. I wish I had time to tell you what God did in East Belfast with alcoholics and terrorists. In Templemore Avenue, there were clubs and pubs and, and terrorists, and to see, see many of them, one for Christ, many of them today in full-time work reaching alcoholics for Christ. Thank God for the ministry of God. But the Apostle Paul not only thanked God for the ministry of the gospel, thank God for the miracle of the gospel. He was looking at his own life. For me, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious to the church of Christ, but I did it ignorantly on unbelief. But thank God for mercy and love and grace. And that changed me. And the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road met Jesus Christ as Savior, and thank God his life was transformed. Can I say tonight that every conversion is a miracle? It takes a miracle for a man or a woman to pass from death unto life, to take a person out of darkness and bring them into the light of the gospel. As the Bible puts it, He has translated us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. If you're a Christian tonight, thank God for the miracle of grace. Thank God for the ministry. Thank God for the miracle. Thank God for the message. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. What a message, Martin Luther said. If we were to condense the Bible, all of the Bible, to one phrase, this would be the phrase, this is the message, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Oh, my friend, the Apostle Paul said, I needed it. I was the chief of sinners. I've proved it. It's a faithful saying. I recommend it. It's worthy of all acceptation. Thank God for the ministry, for the miracle. Thank God for this message of the gospel. And then he finishes by saying, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Thank God for the melody, the melody of praise to our great Savior. I know my time is gone, but let me finish by saying this. I remember... In the town of Boca do Acre, where we worked for a while, a Saturday night, a number of our missionaries were together for a conference, and we were conducting an open-air meeting in the middle of the town. 
And I remember going around with gospel tracts to the people who were standing by. And one man, as I got speaking to him, oh, he said, Pastor Victor, I'd love to become a Christian. I said, come with me. His little, our little church was nearby. I will take you in there. And you, you call upon God for mercy. You ask the Lord to save you. He said, I can't do it. Fred Orr arrived at my side, and Fred tried to persuade the man. And the man said, listen, I've got a problem. I've already booked a hall. I've organized a party and a dance. I've invited the people. I've bought the drink. I've got to go there. But tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning I'll be at church. Tomorrow I'm going to become a Christian. And so it was reluctantly he went away. Later that night at the party, some young people tried to get in who were barred because they were underage, but very soon a fight started and fists were flying and feet were kicking and blood was flowing. And the police swooped down and arrested some of these young people and arrested our friend who said, tomorrow, tomorrow I'll get saved. That night he, sp he spent in the clink in a little simple police station in Boca do Acre. He had alleged that Zhuangji Deus, a young man of 16, is the one who had started the fight. And so it was at 5 o'clock daylight the next morning. They took our friend and they frog-marched him up the town to the side of the river, down the river bank into a dugout canoe to go across the river Acre to a place called Santa Maria to arrest Zhuangji Deus. When the brothers of Zhuangji Deus saw the police coming with this man, they shouted, Zhuang, run, run to the forest. They're coming for you. Zhuang didn't run. He went to the wall of that little jungle house and took down his rifle and cane to the window and took carefully in. And when he pulled the trigger, a bullet whistled through the air into the temple of our friend who said, tomorrow I'll get saved. Tomorrow I'll be at church. Tomorrow I'll, I'm going to become a Christian. That bullet to the temple not only killed him, but threw him into the river Acre. His body was never found again. We found his, his tennis shoe with his foot still in it. Piranha fish had eaten him. My friend, I'll tell you this tonight. If God is speaking to your heart, don't put it off to another night, another time, another day. Seek the Lord while he may be found. God bless you. Heavenly Father, Take these simple words, story of your amazing grace, and bless them to every heart tonight. And do bless the work and witness of this church, your servant who serves you here faithfully in the gospel. We commit them to thee and pray your blessing on each one. In Christ's name, amen. Thank our brother, Mr. Maxwell, for coming along tonight and giving us that wonderful testimony. And we do pray that it will bless, be blessed to every heart. I believe it has been. Just to say that if you're here tonight and the Lord has spoken to you, and you're not saved. Maybe you're listening in tonight and you're still not a Christian, but the Lord has spoken to you. Get saved tonight. If we can be any help, please wait behind in the meeting. Get in touch with us. But come to the Savior this evening. May God bless you. And may God bless you. Bring you safely home. We'll ask this church now to come. And they're going to show you to the door. Thank you. God bless.